very exciting program tonight, so I want to take care of some business first. Um, as you know, um, when you got your notice, if you got a note on the top, it was written that you were past due on your dues. Um, they did it for about a third of the people that were mailing out 150 things to um, every month, so that you know that you are overdue, and so please get your dues up to date if you can, as soon as possible. Jim is more than willing to take checks from anybody, and um, <laughs> make them out to the Historical Society. Not to Jim. Not to Jim. <laughs> please not to Jim. Uh, I'll take them too. <laughs> no kickbacks either. Mm -hmm. um, we also are always collecting money for the high school award, and uh, we try to give $1,000 to a student who shows uh, demonstrates to the committee that they value learning about local history and the importance of local history. Learning. And um, we have lately been getting some pretty good candidates. In fact, the year before last, we had two very good ones, and we split the award then. Um, the archives, which we have downstairs in Village Hall are always looking for volunteers and we really need some that are computer savvy too, that help us to digitize and um, put digitized images of photos into folders on computers so that we can figure out where they go and time frame and location. So if anybody wants to volunteer down there, it just sees one of us. And they're usually there either Monday mornings or Tuesday mornings. And uh, David Greenwood would like somebody to help him do part of this. Jane, uh, John Katie's photos is one of the big things we're doing right now. So everybody knows that John took pictures of everything, everywhere. And he's <laughs> got the most fabulous history of the village from the 1940s. Is that what he started about? Yeah. Uh, right up through it, he's still taking them constantly. So uh, we're trying to get all those in some sort of order. And his sister is helping him too, I know. <laughs> That's Helen sitting right there. Uh, right, we have a suggestion box here if anybody has ideas for programs or anything else that we need to just fill them out one of the cards there and put it in. Uh, we have postcards for our meetings. All our meetings for the year are on this. And so if anybody didn't get one in their program and they want one, just pick one up. The other important thing, when you came in tonight, you were given a form for the bylaws, amend, amending the bylaws. We're in the process of rewriting the bylaws, but to do that, you can only vote on the annual meeting. And we really need two amendments right now. And so we were given those amendments and asked to vote on them so that we can change things. The one is that we need to uh, make sure for all nonprofits in New York State, all board members need to have a non-conflict of interest statement so that I can't be using my position to better some corporation that I have stock in <laughs> through the society or whatever. That's just an example. So, um, and, But we need an amendment to make that a legal thing for all of us to have to do. The other one is of treasure needs a debit card. Uh, the archives need a debit card uh, because a debit card requires one signature and we have on our bylaws that all monies need to be taken out of the treasury with two signatures. We need this amendment, but to replenish the debit card, that will require two signatures, so we are staying within the law, our bylaws that we have now. So that's the other amendment. And then the third one is just a proxy form, so that if a trustee knows they're going to be absent from any meeting and a vote is coming up that they want to participate in, they can give their vote to somebody else to cast, and they can tell them how they want it cast, if they know specifically, or they can trust that person to cast it the way they want, either way, but it's a proxy form. 
So those are the three amendments, and I request that all members that are here vote on those and just hand it in at the end of the night. Okay? Um, the only other thing is Allison. I'm wondering if you want to talk about meetings and a future meeting and uh, okay. this other one? Okay, yeah. And so Diane already mentioned this card that all the members should have already received in the mailing in January. But this is our listing for the year. And I just want to mention we got together on December 1st um, to put the programs together for this coming for 2017. And for 20 years we've been doing this, nine programs a year, nine months, and we never run out of programs. And it's always a lot of fun sitting around the table and everybody sort of putting ideas out and then we match them up to months and we get programs together. And it's a lot of fun. And uh, this year we were honored to have Will Tatum <laughs> here with us at the meeting. And he really brings a lot as being the county historian. He brings, uh, you know, a networking really to us. He can network with, with all the towns within the county and um, the state programs that we might have available to us and the grants. Uh, that might be available. So that was a big help. And as a result, he's on our agenda for two programs this year. Tonight is one. Um, so it brings a fresh um, outer um, you know, program, I think, into us, which is always fun. And so it, when you look through the programs, I just want to say I think we have a lot of exciting ones, which I always think. Um, but each one that you look at is really a building block to where we are now in Millbrook. Um, when you look at, um, you know, the the architect James Ware, that'll be in April. Um, he designed Halcyon Hall and Mohonk Mountain House as well, as long as as well as I think having influence on some other buildings within the village, um, some residential places, and the WCTU Women's Christian Temperance Movement. Um, that will be in May. So that was a big part of our history. And um, we're having a tea this year at Millbrook School uh, to talk about the mill, which was, you know, mills were a significant part of our landscape here before the railroad came through, probably, and, um, you know, another life started. Um, and then in July, we have a special program at Charlotte's Restaurant. We're hosting the um, what they're extending the uh, the uh, historic tavern trail from last year. Um, Dutchess County sponsored the historic tavern trail, which was a big success. So they're extending it to this year and and uh, adding on the temperance movement and prohibition. And temperance movement really had uh, a significant role here in Dutchess County and even in Millbrook uh, when you look back in the records back into the 1800s. And um, so we'll learn about that and be at Charlotte's, which started out as Methodist Church. So that should all be very interesting. <laughs> a lot of fun. So we welcome everybody. That's July 14th at Charlotte's, so the middle of summer. And then um, Robert McHugh will be talking about Lucretia Mott, uh, an abolitionist and suffragette. Um, and and uh, Will Tatum will be back in October. And then... Um, in November, we end with a fireside chat with the Keating family, <laughs> which would, should be very nice. So we're all looking forward to that. So that's that. And so please, if you don't have a program card, pick one up, put it on your refrigerator. And something else quickly that I'd like to mention, and I have the flyers out for that. Um, it, it's a program we're having at Merritt Bookstore, and there are currently uh, photos hanging in the upstairs gallery. But it's uh, Saturday, March 4th at 2 p.m. And it's, it's a talk. It'll be a slide presentation and talk on how the early iron industry in Connecticut and New York and Massachusetts helped initiate the growth of metals and machine technology <coughs> in Connecticut's Grass Valley. And I never realized that Connecticut, the Naugatuck River Valley, was such a significant area for the production of brass. It goes like from Winstead to Torrington to Ansonia. Um, but the photos that are there were taken beginning in 2011, just 2011, when he started photographing the old mills, um, you know, from 100 years ago. And um, 
the last mill actually closed in 2013. So we're talking history, but up into our present lives. And that's it. Well, she you didn't, pick up those she didn't mention that, that next month's meeting, which would be March 16th, is going to be here, of course, but it's going to be on Lyle Federated Church and the combination of the three churches that came together and how they came together in the history of it. And, and actually, we wanted to mention on that, too, the title of that talk is um, Lyle Memorial and Estuarial Congregation. So we don't want you to be scared off by any <laughs> words that you might have to look up. But I think that what that means is, you know, it's, it's the flow of, of input into a congregation and, you know, the tide, the ebbs of the tide, and um, there's new blood and the old salts that stay, and you know, so it's a lot of history, and so it's, you know, it's, it's the old history and up to the present sort of thing. So that should be fun. Thank you. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Will Tatum, um, the Dutchess County historian, who will be telling us all about our ancient documents and the program that he has for uh, digitizing and putting them all online so that they are available to all of us. Thank you, Diane. So before I kick off, I want to draw your attention to two other individuals who are here as guests tonight. The first, yes, Bill, I'm going to ask you to stand. Oh, we have Bill Jeffways from the town of Milan and also from the Red Hook Historical Society. Bill is doing a wonderful amount of work putting videos online. He's just put one online for the upcoming Milan Bicentennial, but if you go to his site, which is historyspeaks.us, You'll see all sorts of Perfect. amazing things. Thank you. Perfect. And he's also helping <laughs> nice the historian's <laughs> office out with a bunch of stuff. But even more importantly, as much as I love Bill, Brad Kendall, <laughs> your county clerk and my boss, is here tonight. And I'd like to invite Brad up because these are really his documents. Brad has been an extremely good custodian of them. He was the one who, when I was first hired, said, we need to take care of these, and he's been incredibly supportive of them all along. So before I tell you about what we've done in the past couple of years, I'd like Brad to give us an idea of what was there before. Heck, well, um, the operative word was boss. That's <laughs> <laughs> more important. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to take very much of your time. Uh, but we were at a joint conference last uh, fall in Albany talking about history and county clerks. And so I talked about an analogy. <clears throat> this is my 11th year as county clerk, and there's a lot of day-to-day -day stuff. So if you think of the county clerk's office as a three-story of colonial house, first story has been modified for day-to-day -day, um, DMV work, receiving, people are in and out all day long, you, you know, it's very busy. Up on the second floor, we have record storage, um, more recent record storage, that if you need to go find out uh, a former court case in the last 20 or 30 years, something like that, you can go up to the second floor. We know we have the attic, and we know we have good stuff in the attic, but we never get the chance to go to the attic and look around in the old stuff. Uh, so five, four years ago, five years ago, when uh, Mark Molinaro became county executive, I was the county clerk. Uh, <coughs> together, we uh, renewed a commitment in, in Dutchess County to uh, fund the county historian, um, because we needed somebody to look around in that attic. And this is the result of looking around. Um, the ancient documents, uh, people would laugh if you were in Europe, uh, they only started in about 1721, uh, that's ancient for us, but they are the uh, records of, uh, of the courts back in the 1700s, uh, 1800s. And uh, Will has been terrific about writing grants uh, through New York State Archives. It's been funded through state money. Every transaction we do, every piece of paper we take has a surcharge on it to fund records management in the county at the state level, and then we get to apply to try to get some of our money back. Uh, and we've been very uh, successful at that. We have four grants, and we're working on our fifth now. Um, so I'm going to let Will take you through our act. So ancient documents, as you've already heard, kind of stumps a lot of people, because when they hear Dutchess County has an ancient documents collection, a lot of folks are like, really, are they Hebrew, Latin, maybe a little bit of Greek? It's like, no. They're in English, and they are what you can see right there. Um, Linda, if you could get the lights, that'd be great. Maybe make them stand out a little bit more now. They are the records of the Dutchess County Courts, 
which operated from 1721 and in this form all the way up until 1894 when the modern unified court system came into being. So these go all the way back to really the very beginnings of government and the county. For those of you who are on top of your county trivia, you probably know that Duchess was one of the original counties laid out in 1683 and was specifically laid out because folks over in Connecticut and Massachusetts were beginning to wander over the Housatonic, looking for land, and the royal governor down in New York City and his council were a little worried that they'd wake up one day and the western border of the colony of Connecticut would suddenly be on the Hudson River, which is something they wanted to avoid. So they set up Dutchess County in 1683. The population was very small and growing, however. So by 1690, the colonial government had said, all right, you know what, Ulster County will administer Dutchess County instead of Dutchess having its own independent government. We didn't get that until starting in 1714 with the first elections, and then in 1721, this court system is established. And to give you an idea about how small is too small population-wise, in 1714, they did a census to figure out basically who in the county could vote, but they noted down everyone, men, women, children, old, young, free, and enslaved, and they came up with a grand total of 447 people. <laughs> now, modern Dutchess County is 800 square miles, which often, if you're driving from point to point within it, feels more like 10,000 square miles. But 18th century Dutchess County included all of Putnam County and a pretty sizable chunk of southern Columbia County, so well over 1,000 square miles with 447 people living in it. Now, what we suspect is that the folks conducting that census did not get out here to east of the uh, Taconic Mountains. So the story here is a little bit different, and that's why you have this title down here of the Oblong. We'll get to exactly what that means, but essentially I have presentations for every distinct section of Dutchess County. So if you hear an ancient documents talk being advertised up in Red Hook, you will not hear the same stories there that you hear here. And um, to get one point that I feel really bad about out of the way up front, the promo for this did mention slaves, because I thought I remembered a document talking about a runaway slave from Massachusetts here in Eastern Duchess. And we'll explain in a little bit why that, why a runaway slave would have been in Eastern Duchess. I could not locate it, or locate it for tonight's presentation. All the stuff I could locate on slaves, are in Western Duchess. So I encourage you to come to one of those other presentations <laughs> later on in the year to hear some of those stories. So our story begins here. This is the Duchess County Courthouse. Specifically, this is the earliest surviving image we have of what it looked like. So you have a two-story <coughs> house in that classical Georgian form with a really huge steeple thingy here. This is from our 1804 turnpike map, which is the Duchess Turnpike, modern Route 44, which you can actually come to the county clerk's office at 22 Market Street today and see. And the building that you will see next to 22 Market Street, officially at 10 Market Street, the modern county courthouse, sits on that same piece of land. We have had five county courthouses in Duchess County. The first approximately built in 1720, the most recent one in 1902, all standing on the same location. The first three burned, then they built a fourth one in stone, which they couldn't figure out a way to burn. But they knocked it down in 1902 because they needed more space, and that's how we got the one today. All of the records we're talking about tonight were effectively made here when the courts met. And the actual schedule of those meetings changed over the course of the 18th century. The very beginning in the 1720s, they're meeting twice a year, once in the springtime, and once in the fall, normally April, May for the spring meeting, and then October for the fall meeting. That meant if you were arrested and put in jail, which incidentally was in the basement of the county courthouse in August or June, or the day after the court met in April, you stayed there until October. So you talk about jail issues, they've been around since the beginning. But over the 18th century and into the 19th century, that meeting schedule expanded to the point where by the 19th century you have pretty much monthly meetings of the court. Now, what are we talking about in terms of the breakdown 
of all of this stuff. Well, this, we've done four phases of imaging work so far on the ancient documents. Now, up until the point where these projects started back in 2013, you had two ways of accessing the ancient documents. You could come to 22 Market Street and request to see the originals, or you could head off to a library that happened to have a microfilm copy of the documents that the Church of Latter-day Saints filmed in 1973. The unfortunate part about that is there was one index created which survived, was not supplanted really until the 1990s when the Genealogical Society did another index. But this one index was done in 1953 by former Vassar President um, Henry Noble McCracken, the author of many books including uh, Old Duchess Forever, Blythe Duchess, etc., etc. And he looked at these documents and said, oh, they're just legal stuff, they're of interest to no one except genealogists which to me as a legal historian is like nails on a chalkboard. It's like, really? As you'll see, there's all sorts of stuff packed in here, but he made a last name index so that you could look up a name and you would see all the document numbers in which that name appeared, which is great if you want to do that research. Unfortunately, he only indexed about 50,000 pages <coughs> of material, which sounds like a lot, except that we have now imaged, in fact by June we will have imaged 82,000 pages of material, and I estimate we've got 200,000 pages still left to go. So there's a tremendous amount of material that was never indexed. Some of it is on the microfilm, but it doesn't have a record number or any other way to figure out where the physical copy is. So there was a real access problem, and of course, we don't control that microfilm. It's owned by the Church of Latter-day Saints. So we've done four phases. Our first phase in um, 2013 to 2014, we did 12,000 pages of documents, which broke down into about 6,000 odd individual documents. Because you know, a document is at least, at least two pages because it's the front and back of a piece of paper. And we are imaging even blank pages it's something that I call the national treasure effect. If you've seen that Nicolas Cage movie, it has this idea that, oh, there's a treasure map on the back of the Constitution. And the last thing that I want folks to do is, you know, a hundred years from now, when they're looking at these images, think, they didn't digitize the back of this document. What was on it that they didn't want us to see? Well, it's a blank piece of paper. You can't really tell them that from beyond the grid. So 12,000 documents turns into, 12,000 pages turns into 6,000 documents. And this is basically the breakdown in your pie chart form. So this very slightly lighter shade of blue in the background, those are debt cases. You've got a small slice that's assault, a small slice that's bastardy. We'll get to what that means later. And then we have our other, which is all kinds of other legal instruments, accounts, items that are entered into evidence, even things like lists of municipal officers that are elected every year that just wander into this collection. And this has been one of the exciting things from the State Archives point of view. We're the only county that's tackling this collection. And we happen to be the county that's in that sweet spot between the curves of the age of the collection and the completeness of the collection. So there are other counties, for example, Ulster County, that have older documents than we do because their courts were in operation before ours. However, those records are more fragmentary than ours are. There are younger counties established after the revolution, in some cases way after the revolution, that have a much more complete record, but it's not as old. So we have the oldest, most complete record in the state. A county clerk who supports the work and state archives has given us over $100,000 now to image these documents. It's not something that we can do in-house because they're very fragile and they're sent to specialist companies to do it, but we do index them in-house. And in fact, uh, Linda, one of your fellow members here, is helping out with the indexing. We are always happy to have volunteers assist. So if this sounds like something of interest, let me know after our program. But as far as New York State Archives knew, theoretically, the documents that should be in here should all be related to debt, because the county clerk was also the clerk of the court. But the records that you were supposed to get were all of the civil court cases, none of the criminal court cases. So things like assault is a criminal matter rather than a civil matter. Nevertheless, it turns up in this material. 
And over the course of the evening, I promise that what I'm going to do, you may or may not believe this, we're going to start with money, we're going to go to violence, and we're going to go to sex, which I'm going to link back to money. Because those are the three key elements of any you know, gripping discussion. Now, how do you go about seeing all these wonderful digitally imaged and indexed things? Well, right here we have the Dutchess County website, duchessny.gov. If you put in duchessny.gov forward slash county clerk, it will take you to the county clerk's landing page. There are other ways to get there, of course, to even Google search Dutchess County Clerk. When you look down the left side of the menu, you will see a link here that says Ancient Document Search. If you click on that, it will take you to the landing page. And the landing page has some stuff about the ancient documents, what they are, how many pages there are of them, and the types of searches you can do. You can then click on the button, continue, and that will take you to the search window where you can search for the names of the individuals mentioned in the document, you can search for the location where it took place, and generally what we have is Poughkeepsie because that's the, the place where the document was created, where it identifies in the document that, oh, this dispute happened in Beekman or in Charlotte, which is what the town of Washington was known as in the 18th century. We put that down, but more often than not, because these are debt cases, they say, oh, debt contracted at Poughkeepsie and blah, 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 because everyone went to Poughkeepsie to do their business, normally when the court was meeting. So theoretically, you could contract a debt at one court session and then be brought to the next court session because you hadn't fulfilled the debt. All sorts of weird and crazy things happen. You can search by record type, year, document number, or offense. And in this case, I just put in bastardy because it is... An interesting crime. Again, we'll get to that in a little bit. But can everyone see this okay? Is this sharp enough for you? You can all hear me? Okay. A little louder. A little louder? All right, we'll try to do that. So, what is the oblong? This really, really busy map shows an overlay of all of the land patents with the original municipal precincts with the modern towns of Dutchess County, which is why you kind of have to get on top of it with a magnifying glass to look at it. But the oblong could mean two different things, which are also overlapping things. It is something that historians tend to argue about a lot, so I'll, pardon me if I go into this a little bit too detailed, but I want you guys to understand how it's sort of amorphous east of the Taconics, even in 18th century Dutchess. So specifically, the oblong is this literal oblong shape of territory that is along the New York and Connecticut border. Now, this was a disputed region from the 17th century onwards. New York claimed it, Connecticut claimed it, neither could really substantiate a better claim than the other, neither really sent in any officials to the area. So it was kind of theoretically this lawless region, that's why the Quakers, the Society of Friends, end up here and whatnot. But in 1731, they signed a treaty called the Treaty of Dover, which cedes this long, oblong-shaped stretch of territory to New York, establishing the official border, for which Connecticut gets some great seaside real estate that we might want back, might not. <laughs> Some for discussion. The thing about the oblong patent, which is the name for that section of territory ceded by the treaty, is it is only about 100 rods wide, which is, oh. now roughly think about it as 100 yards wide, a little bit more than 100 yards, but it is really tiny narrow. It slices through every single town that butts up against the modern Connecticut border, so Pauline, Dover, Armenia, and Northeast. But the thing is, when you look at these documents that talk about the oblong, they seem to be using that to reference not this little tiny slice of territory, which honestly can't contain that many people. They seem to be using it to describe everything east of the Taconics, because the Taconics in 18th century Dutchess County were more or less like the Himalayan mountains today. <laughs> Getting over them was a real problem, and folks in western Dutchess generally didn't like to make the trip, which is why you have Quakers settling here. In the 18th century, it gets to the point where 
you have as many Quakers here in Eastern Duchess as you do in Philadelphia, if you can imagine that. One of the first declarations against slavery, in fact, was made down at the uh, Quaker Hill Meeting House in Pauling. And of course, you've got the Nine Partners Meeting House that's here. And we will, we've got a few Quaker-related items, but essentially, Eastern Duchess was its own world. And that generated some interesting cases. So is everyone clear on the issue of what the oblong may or may not mean, or at least the two definitions? Because you're going to hear stuff from all over modern Eastern Duchess in terms of um, cases. All right, so debt. We're going to start with the money. We're going to go to the violence. We're going to go to the sex, which is going to bring us back to the money. So out of 6,124 documents in phase one, a startling 4,700 were about debt. So, more than um, half. Well, more than half. And why is that? Well, it is a civil court, but it's also the fact that in the colonies, all of them, but especially New York, under British rule, you did not have a lot of hard specie, hard currency. In the 18th century, that is gold, silver, and copper. Can anyone take a guess as to why the British did not want a lot of hard specie here in the colony? No, that's, that's serious. Any guesses? Because if you have hard currency, you can buy stuff from people other than the English. Because, you know, it may not be the currency of France, but French traders recognize gold for gold. They'll take British gold sovereigns any day of the week. So the British idea was, let's starve the colonies of any kind of hard currency. And as a result, they'll have to operate on credit, and that credit will have to be secured by all of the raw materials that they send back to Britain. So it makes great sense from an office in London when you're setting up this colonial system on a big map. Here in the colonies, however, it's like credit card debt only worse. So essentially what you have is everyone owes someone else something. And the 18th century form of credit card was a bond or a promissory note. And that's what you see here. Don't worry, I know it's difficult to read. I can't read it. I just wanted to give you all an idea of what size these things are. So that's approximately 8 inches wide by 14 long. Yes, ma'am? They didn't have any tobacco for currency? Well, the question is, did they have tobacco for currency? Tobacco is really more of a southern thing than a New York thing, but the barter economy only goes so far, because it depends on you and the other person being able to agree that a pound of tobacco is worth a dozen eggs. And if you can't come to that agreement, then, oh well. Whereas using promissory notes and using bonds, you can effectively use currency, but it's just like using a credit card today. Instead of handing over dollar bills, what you're really doing is promising that you will pay back the credit card company, and the credit card company in exchange is paying the vendor. So in this case, and yes, we're going to give you guys uh, some close-ups so that you can at least see what these documents look like. But you have a fellow named Samuel Benedict of the Oblong in Dutchess County. So that's the first example right there of its use in the documents. And it's not like a little hundred yard stretch. It seems to suggest a large enough area that everyone knows where it is. Who's a carpenter is indebted to Stephen St. John of Norwalk in the county of, or sorry, in the, yeah, county of Fairfield, colony of Connecticut, who's a merchant for the sum of seven pounds, 14 shillings, and 10 pence current money of New York. So, 7 pounds, 14 shillings, and 10 pence. What the heck does that mean today? Well, normally as a rule of thumb, what we think about is what does labor buy in the 18th century versus today? So your basic formulaic level of labor in 18th century America and Britain is your agricultural day labor. Who goes out and either plants or harvests or does whatever else needs to be done on the farm. He earns approximately four pounds a year. This guy is contracting a debt for seven pounds and change. Now, since this is a merchant, what it may very well be is that he's walked into this merchant shop and said, I need that, that, and that, what's the total? Seven pounds, etc., etc. And so he swears out this bond, which says, I will pay it to you. Now, the thing is, 
This bond is sworn out on the 13th of April, 1759. And he says, I'm going to pay you back by May 14th. So a month from now, I'm going to get you all this money, which is great because you're kind of wondering where's the money going to come from. Not really uh, Stephen St. John's problem, but it becomes his problem because a month later in May, Stephen St. John turns up in Poughkeepsie suing Samuel Benedict for that money that Samuel Benedict owes. And now it's the May court session. We don't have an exact date. Because normally when you have these documents, this is called a declaration where the plaintiff sets out his or her version of the case. They just say, in this case, May Court Session of 1759. But it's pretty clear that um, Mr. St. John is watching the clock. He's not going to give Samuel Benedict the opportunity to go too long without paying his debt. However, other cases we see, it's 10 years between when the debt is contracted and when they're finally taking someone to court. There's no statute of limitations in the 18th century, so you better behave. But what we have here is essentially the reverse of what we saw in this previous document. So Samuel Benedict in his bond says, I promise to pay you this money by the 14th day of May next. And the declaration, we have Stephen St. John saying that, oh, Samuel Benedict hasn't paid you. And that's the vast majority of all of those debt cases, which is great if you're a historian of debt and credit and how you function in a society without hard species. But for those of us who like the seedy underside of history, it's a little bit yawny. But don't worry, this is the only one of those that we're going to do tonight. I just want to give you guys an indication of what's in the collection. However, a certain set of these debt materials tell you what the debt is for. Now, the most frequently purchased item on credit in 18th century Dutchess County is liquor. <laughs> that turns out more than anything else. The specific phrase is various merchandises and liquor over and over and over again. And it's like, wow, I guess there's not a whole lot to do on a Friday night in Dutchess <laughs> County in 1727. But then we occasionally get these glimpses that tell us even more about what's going on in the county during that period. In this specific case, we have a declaration that is from Nathaniel Berry of Poughkeepsie, who's complaining about two gentlemen, Joseph Boyce and John Hamblin of Dover. And what has happened is that at the previous court session, Nathaniel Berry had contracted with short, yeah, excuse me, Joseph Boyce and John Hamblin for one ton of refined iron to be delivered from Dover where they had set up an iron factory. And that tells us a lot of interesting things. First of all, it shows us that there is proof of iron industry operating along the Connecticut border, which we know of from archaeology and from other sources. However, the thought about what that iron industry is doing in the 1700s is it's producing pig iron. So they're pulling it out of the ground and they are maybe melting it down into ingots and sending it over to Great Britain where it's going to be refined further and turned into things like scissors and hoes and knives and everything else you need. But Nathaniel Berry is contracting for refined iron, so they are at least refining a small supply of iron on site in Eastern Duchess in the 1750s, which is a direct violation of British imperial codes. If they'd been caught doing that, they probably would have been in a great deal of trouble. But it's this amazing insight of where are you going to get this elsewhere? Because they're not going to write down that they're doing this. It's only going to come up when they fail to deliver. And a ton of iron is a lot yeah. of iron that they've got to get from Dover to Poughkeepsie. It's like it's only in a court record where something like that is going to pop up. Now, Quakers, I promised you Quakers. And we will have Quakers. Where do they turn up? Well, as you guys probably know, because the Quaker history is so rich and deep in the town of Washington and the village of Millbrook, Quakers really more or less don't have a lot to do with the government in the 18th century. They don't take oaths and they prefer to live a separate life away from all of the craziness of mainstream society during the period. And for the most part, 
colonial government leaves them alone. But there's a problem that occurs in the 1750s, and this problem is called the French and Indian War today, which is largely fought on New York's frontier. And while these battles are taking places at spots like Fort Ticonderoga up in the North Country, on Lake Ontario, all the way out to Niagara County, there is the fear that maybe the French and more likely the Native Americans will mount raids all the way down into the Hudson Valley, and thus we need to be prepared here in Dutchess County and all of the other Mid-Hudson counties for this to happen. So in 1755, the Colonial Assembly passes a law that says if you are a man in decent physical condition, i.e. if you, know, you can walk, and obey orders, and that's basically it, then you have to sign up for militia service. You can sign, you have the choice, you can sign up in an infantry company or a cavalry company, but if you don't sign up, you will pay 40 shillings for every three months you go without signing up, and 40 shillings is two pounds, and remember, your common agricultural labor makes four pounds a year, so this is not an unsubstantial amount of money. But that legislation specifically mentions Quakers, because it recognizes in there, okay, Quakers don't do military service because that is part of their religion, and even though we need all the able-bodied men, we'll let them off easy. Instead of having to pay 40 shillings, they'll only have to pay us 20 shillings. And they'll have to register with the county clerk, Henry Livingston, who also happens to be the county treasurer at the time, and they're supposed to pay him this money. But the years go by, 1759 arrives, and they keep renewing this act. And it turns out that there are about a dozen Quakers, whom we have um, records for, who went out in 1755, they went to a justice of the peace, and swore, yes, I'm a Quaker, send my info to Poughkeepsie, which they did, and then they just kind of forgot to pay the fine, which is a little bit of a problem for county government at this time. And so you see, for example, here, Abraham Chase, son of Henry Chase, of the Oblong in Beekman's precinct. So they're saying the Oblong, and they're saying Beekman, which suggests to me that they are again using the Oblong to refer to all of Eastern Duchess, and they're being, no, the Oblong, Eastern Duchess, and specifically Beekman within the Oblong. That he had signed up for this, he's exempted from military service, but he did not, of course, pay up. So in this case, this is a, do a document type called a warrant of penalty, where a county court judge is telling the constables, go find Abraham Chase and take all of the money that he owes us out of his stuff. So essentially what the, the constables are going to do, they're going to go to Abraham Chase's house, or Henry Chase's father, and they're going to look around and say, you know, you've got some really nice stuff, I like that end table, that chair would really pull the room together, and they're going to take away everything they see that's of value, and they're going to auction it off. And out of whatever proceeds there are, they're going to pay his debts to the county, and if there's any left, then they'll give it back to him. But, you know, it's, it's a pretty rough thing to do. And um, just sort of to add insult to injury, the judge says at the end of this warrant that if no goods can be found of the said Abraham Chase whereon to levy the same, if he doesn't have enough stuff to add up to the value of his debt, then you are to take the body of the said Abraham Chase and safely convey him to the county jail of the said county, commanding you, the keeper of the said jail, safely to keep him in your custody until he shall pay the same. So essentially what that means is if you arrive and there's nothing in the house, you grab the guy, you take him back to Poughkeepsie, you throw him in jail until his buddies show up with the cash. So, yeah, Dutchess County, rough enough Quakers. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. We've gotten the money, and now we're about to go to violence. Because, you know, constables taking your stuff and potentially arresting you, that's a type of violence. But we've got something even better in our next document. Are there any hotelings here tonight, by any chance? Does anyone know a hotel? Yes, well, be sure to let them know that they missed out on a great family story <laughs> Did you know that there was bushwhacking happening in Charlotte Precinct, i.e. the town of Washington, in 1762? So what we have here is the sworn testimony of Rachel Snyder, who is the daughter of John Hotel. 
she lives up in Albany with her husband, but she's come back down to visit her father and deposes to the court that she saw her father hoteling load his gun with two bullets and said that he intended to shoot Captain James Isaiah Ross, the said Ross being gone along the road in front of their house. Her father intended to lay by the road and shoot him as he came back, being about that time that the said Ross and her father had some dispute <coughs> in law, and that she and her mother and Jacob, the son of John Hotelling, tried to stop him, but he wouldn't hear it, so he went out and hid by the side of the road, waiting for Captain Isaiah Ross to come riding back by and to shoot him. And he's out there for about two hours, gets tired of it because Captain Ross hasn't come back by. So John Hotelling comes back up to the house and his wife says, you know, God would not suffer you to go through with your intention. To which John Hotelling said that the devil told said Ross that he was waiting for him or else Ross would have come home. <laughs> and that the said Hotelling said if he saw said Ross, he would not be obliged to pay any money to the said Ross for he would shoot him. And uh, he then went down to the road to wait again for another hour, just in case Ross came by. Now, the interesting twist to all of this, this is you know, taken up in Poughkeepsie, where they have the court together. And the clerk is reading back Rachel's sworn testimony that she's sworn out to a local justice of the peace. And then they ask her to confirm it, and Rachel says um, specifically that she did not know anything set forth in her oath aforesaid, nor ever knew or had heard anything concerning the same. I have no idea what you're talking about. I never made that deposition. Are you kidding me? So they end up charging her with perjury. <laughs> now, unfortunately, one of the, the downsides of the documents is they are scattered and fragmentary. So in any given case like this one, you would expect to find six or seven pieces of paper, beginning with that declaration where, for example, Captain Isaiah Ross might have come in and said, well, you know, I want you to go arrest John Hotelling because he's trying to kill me. And he would have set forth this story, there would have been the depositions of which this is one, and then he would have gone all the way through to a judgment record which would set down all the details of the case and the jury and judge's final decision. This is the only document we have from this case. So we have no idea right now about how it ends. There's a possibility that there might be other documents in there, but all this stuff has been shuffled over time. The collection is not in name order, it's not in year order, it's sort of, they found these piles of paper and started stamping numbers on them. Now the beauty of what we're doing with all of this indexing and putting things online is I can go into the index file and tap, type John Hotelling or Captain Isaiah Ross and it will pop up with every single document that those names are in, which allows us to do something called digital reconstruction of the collection. We can take all of these scattered pieces from the same court file, if they still exist, and bring them all back together again, which is something that you can't really do without computers and digital imagery. Now, I'm sure you think that the idea of a hotel <coughs> sitting beside a road with a gun loaded with two bullets waiting for his rival, who's probably suing him for debt, let's be honest, to come by and shoot him is bad, but it's not bad enough. We've got to go another <laughs> level here. We're going to a prisoner escape. So this is a little bit later. This is 1787, and you have Jonathan Herrick, who is one of the constables for Amelia, who is bringing Amos Porter, his prisoner, who's a horse thief caught in the town of Washington, all the way to Poughkeepsie for trial. And Herrick and Amos Porter stop at a common house, um, a tavern that's run by Isaac Baldings in Poughkeepsie. And there they meet Moses Haight III. And I'm emphasizing the third because this is the only document I've ever read in ancient documents where they give you know, the, the generational count at the end. You never see any juniors or seniors, but there's this one third. So they're pre presumably sitting there. Um, Amos Porter has his hands tied. And Moses Haight III walks up to him and says, Hey, you know, what's going on? Why are you tied up? What's happening? And Porter says, Well, I'm accused, just accused, of horse theft, and I'm being taken to court. 
And uh, hoteling says, huh, oh, sorry, not hoteling, um, hate says, that's interesting. Well, and I quote, you should, should not cry. He would clear him for 20 shillings and would clear Hill, another person, that is now in jail for the same sum. And so they go about talking, the prisoner, whose name is Porter, and this Hate the Third. And after a while, Hate says, you know, give me something to seal this deal. And the prisoner, Amos Porter, gives Hate the shirt off his back, literally. <laughs> and, you know, Jonathan here, the constable is presumably just sitting there watching this happen and not doing anything about it. <laughs> but they go their own way, probably drinking a little. Most of these stories begin that way. And suddenly he notices that Porter has pulled out a knife that he didn't previously have. Porter has slashed his binding, so he's now loose. And then Porter went on to make several attempts to stab and cut Jonathan Herrick in sundry places. And gets away, runs off. And so Herrick decides it's not his day, time to go home to Amenia. On the way home, he stops back by that Isaac Balding's house and sees Hate, who says, yeah, you know, I gave that guy that knife while he was here, just wanted you to know. I don't know why Hate would admit that to a constable, but it ends up getting him arrested and <laughs> taken to court. You'd think that there'd be some kind of logical understanding of how this progresses. But we don't know what happened there, or in terms of the end of the story, so to speak. Now, I, I told you we don't have any slaves tonight, but we do have Native Americans. There was a large Native American presence here in Eastern Duchess, originally all across the county, but Eastern Duchess being one of the slower areas to be settled, the Native Americans hold on longer. And some of you might be aware that the Moravian Church actually set up a mission up around modern Pine Plains called Chicomico in the 1740s, where you know, they set up some rough buildings that's basically an approximation of what Chicomico looked like that is not in Pine Plains. I stole that off the internet, so <laughs> don't go driving along Route 199 expecting to see this. But the colonial government starts hearing these rumors about maybe the Native Americans are planning an uprising. We're not sure. So they send Richard Treat and John Sackett. John Sackett, incidentally, is the surveyor who lays out most of the Great Nine Partners' patent which is, we're in the epicenter of it right here. Richard Treat is a local justice of the peace, but they're sent up to Chicomico to see what's going on. And they interview a couple of the Native Americans there. And John Sackett reports that sometime last winter he heard one hatchet to sick. I'm presuming that that's kind of spelled phonetically. Mm -hmm. And one young pony and a squaw named Hannah say that the Moravians told them that they expected a fleet shortly of 5,000 Moravians and Irish who would come over to settle somewhere on the Delaware near the Forks. That the English and Dutch had cheated them out of their land, and when that fleet did come, there would come an army from the west or the southwest from the Flatheads, another tribe, and another from the north, and that together they would drive the country before them, and that they would be masters of their land again, and refuse to say anything else. So. John Sackett's talking to Native Americans were like, sure, we're going to combine with several other tribes, some more Moravians, and some Irish folks, and just wipe out all of the Dutch and English. It's going to be great. And we'll have ribs afterwards. <laughs> and then Richard Treat testifies that he's talking to a Moravian up there, and the Moravian is telling him, well, you know, we have nothing to do with the government of New York. We don't care what the governor of New York thinks. We have a charter from the Archbishop of Canterbury, and that's really the only kind of authority that we're going to listen to. So that's like 17 strikes right there. And it ends up that the royal government of New York suppresses Chicago. They send up people and say, you know what, you're all shut down, leave. And it takes a couple of years for the last of the Moravians to, to head out, but by 1746, 1747, Chicago's gone. There's still a monument up there somewhere for it today. And this, the Chicumco was set up early 1740s, 1740, 1742. And all these depositions are taken in June of 1744. So how the Native Americans show up, they're going to launch, you know, a major uprising. The other way they show up, the interesting part about John Sackett, 
being a surveyor for the nine partners, is he's there. They have some of his reports we do in the ancient documents. And these reports almost always say, I went out to survey X, Y, and Z plats of land, tried to find Indians, could find no Indians. He's always looking for the natives, trying, I guess, to talk to them to figure out you know, which big tree to use to describe as the edge of this piece of land, which subsequent generations will tear their hair out trying to do a title search on to figure out what was the colonial boundary, but he never can find them. Now, the big one, the huge crowning glory of violence and the oblong in 18th century Dutchess County happens in 1761. So in going through the ancient documents, we came across these depositions, of which you've got one right here, the deposition of Jacob Klink. And he starts talking about the fact that the previous Thursday early in the morning, five persons who are now in jail came to his father's house, inquired for three deserters, and that they went about tearing the house apart, beating him up, beating his family up, breaking stuff, they steal a horse, they steal a saddle. You're like, wow, what's going on? Because deserters is a military term. A deserter is a soldier who runs away from the army. But at no point in this deposition does Jacob Klink mention that these guys are soldiers. Then we get to the deposition of Timothy Driscoll. We don't have an image of it for you tonight, but Timothy Driscoll is important because of the second part of this story. We do have the rest of this story for you, actually. But Timothy Driscoll essentially repeats everything that Jacob Klink says. But he mentions that the leader of this group of five crazy guys is called Lieutenant. The other guys keep referring to him as Lieutenant. So it's like, okay, we've got soldiers here. And then we go to the deposition, the examination of Jonathan Mead, who's a blacksmith out in this area. And he says on the 30th day of September, 1761, he's in his shop doing all of his work. When Sergeant Philip Cassidy comes in, ties him up with a rope and starts asking him questions about where deserters can be found in the area. So it's like, okay, what we've got here is something that you see a lot of with the British Army in America during the French and Indian War, is British soldiers run away on a fairly regular basis, and the British Army sends small parties of loyal soldiers out to find them, because it sets a bad precedent if you just let guys run away and don't catch them. Some of them have gotten down here in the Eastern Duchess, which makes sense. It's an area that's kind of a law unto itself. The, the towns here elect their own justices of the peace. They don't really pay attention to Poughkeepsie that much. And so deserters are disappearing into here, and this regiment, turns out it's the 17th Regiment of Foot, sends a group of guys in here to find out what's going on. And of course, what they end up finding out, and we have the deposition of an officer who was sent down to try to find these soldiers. Not the deserters, the soldiers who are the ones that, for example, um, you know, one of the party ran up to Mead, at least according to what he said, and swore he would blow his brains out if he did not tell him were there any strangers or deserters. Well, it turns out that these soldiers have been sent down legitimately. They have all of their paperwork. They come out into Eastern Duchess, and they start looking for deserters. And they've been told that this fellow um, Driscoll is not only hiding deserters, but his, that his daughter has married a deserter. So they go to his house first. And do they rough him up? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. They can't get any information out of him. This is all in the officer's deposition, because he's talking to these guys who were in jail in Poughkeepsie. So they then go to this Jonathan Mead, a blacksmith, who's also supposed to know where deserters are. And they rough him up, maybe yes, maybe no. The, the question mark is because shortly thereafter, it's nighttime, the soldiers bed down for the evening, and before they know it, there's a mob of local people gathered around this barn where they're sleeping, led by two justices of the peace, one of whom is the same guy swearing out these examinations and depositions, who grabbed them beat them up, and then carry them to jail in Poughkeepsie, and throw them in jail. No word is ever sent to the regiment, which is up in Albany, until like a month later, the colonel is thinking, didn't we send guys down to Dutchess <laughs> County to try to locate deserters? What happened to them? So they sent this captain down, 
And what we have is really the captain's letter back to his colonel saying, uh, so this is what really happened. Our guys went into Eastern Duchess. They had information on this guy Driscoll and this guy Mead. They went to try to talk with them. They didn't get any word from them. They settled down for the night, and the local people just grabbed them, beat them up, and threw them into jail. And he's talking with a local attorney, Bartholomew Knoxon, who's also from here in Eastern Duchess, but he's one of the four attorneys who, at, at any given time, there are four attorneys operating in Poughkeepsie, and he operates there for about 20 years. But they're talking to him, and he's like, yeah, we can't get your guys out without an order from the governor of New York. It doesn't matter if you have paperwork that they're legitimate soldiers or not. And ironically, we have their pass and their orders issued and signed by the colonel of the 17th Regiment also in the collection. But I thought that uh, Captain Rykoff's final line to his colonel was interesting. He says, by what information I could collect from the inhabitants, those of the nine partners are a riotous people and levelers by principle. <laughs> Which might be an alternate title for this presentation in the future. Now I told you that we would get from money to violence to sex. So we've just hit the, the tippy top of the violence pyramid, but before we leave it, we've got a grand jury presentment from Beekman in 1762, and a presentment's basically a list of cases that the grand jury thinks should go to trial, because your grand jury is pulled together first to inquire into these <coughs> declarations to see is there actually enough meat here to pull together a trial jury. And in 1762, the grand jury in Beekman is looking at three cases. I've divided them up into three different slides for you because this is how we're going to make that transition. The first case they've got Weston Allen of Beekman Precinct in Dutchess County Yeoman is going to be charged for assault and battery of Edward Briggs. And they think that uh, the court should direct a formal charge to be drawn up in this case to go to trial. So there you have violence. The next case they're bringing up Hezekiah Wilcox of Beekman's Precinct, having a wife now living at a small distance from him and several children with her by the marriage, is currently living in adultery with Abigail Scribner and has a child by her. This we humbly recommend to the court to take some measures to suppress. So, Hezekiah Wilcox is married and he's got a couple of kids by his wife. For whatever reason, they're not cohabitating. And in her absence, you know, she doesn't live that far by. He says, living at a small distance from him. He's taken up with this other woman, has at least one child by her. Which is, of course, against the law during this period. They're calling it adultery. It can also be considered bigamy. Either way, we're now into the sex territory. <laughs> and you thought it couldn't get more scandalous than that? Well, I have news for you. So the final case in this presentment, you have John Pierce of Beekman Precinct for living in adultery with the widow of Jedediah Bennett. So uh, presumably this fellow, John Pierce, is not married. He doesn't have any children or whatnot. His crime is living in sin, essentially, with this widow, who also doesn't have a husband. In the 21st century, this would not be a, be a big eye issue. <laughs> The irony in all of this, and they say this right up here, is that the woman is willing and desirous to be married, agreeable to a promise between them. Ah, so John Pierce said, sure, I'll marry you. Just move in. Everything will be cool. But this hasn't happened. So the jury likewise presents to the court that this is an offense which ought to be punished. Now, since I did say bigamy, and largely because Linda was in the office when I uncovered this the other day. We're going to fast forward all the way up to 1820. And again, I apologize just a little tiny bit for the uh, somewhat fragmentary nature that I can't tell you the rest of the story, but we have this case that takes place in Washington and Clinton, because it's an amorphous town boundary there in 1820. And the presentment on this is that James L. Teller, late of the town of Washington and the county of Dutchess and state of New York, a laborer, being a person of a wicked disposition, disregarding <laughs> the law of God and man, on the first day of January 1820, being then married and then being the husband of Sally Teller, 
with force and arms at the town of Clinton in the county of Dutchess in the state of New York, then and there feloniously did marry and take to wife one Lydia Duell, spinster, the said Sally Teller, the former wife of the said James L. Teller, being then alive, contrary to the form of the statute in such case made and provided, and against the peace of the people of the state of New York and their dignity. You are offending against the dignity of the people with your bigamy. What were you thinking, James L. Teller? We don't know, because we don't have any depositions from this case where he might uh, defend himself. But all kinds of crazy stuff going on. And now maybe you're wondering, I hope you're wondering, how does he get from all of this stuff back to money? I bring you bastardy. So what is bastardy? <coughs> Technically, bastardy is fathering child out of wedlock. And it's true in the 18th and indeed the 19th century, this was a no-no. It was frowned upon. It wasn't perhaps illegal according to the common law, the, the secular law. But, you know, it's not encouraged either. Why we see these cases in court is because they had a form of social security in the 18th century, social welfare. It's called the poor laws and the poor rates. And you've actually got to go back to England, go back to the reign of the Tudors. So Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, both of those monarchs institute a form of social welfare called the poor rates. And what this means is that your smallest division of government, which in England is the parish, out of their tax money that they collect annually, they're going to pay for the upkeep of the poorest people who live in the parish, the people who just can't provide for themselves. They're too old, they're an orphan child, they've lost a limb, they can't work for whatever reason. And of course, the problem with that is, if you have too many people on the poor rates, then you've got to increase the tax rates, and that's just not going to work out well when election time comes around again. Especially in colonial America, when everyone's having to put up with the fact that we're living on credit because we don't have hard species to begin with. So what you end up seeing is that you've got these municipal officers called the overseers of the poor, and they go around, they're appointed for each town, they go through the town, and they check around, they're like, okay, you know, you're getting poor money, all right, you've lost your left leg, that's cool. You're getting poor money, you're 104 years old, and it's 1760, that's also cool. But then they're like, wait a second, you're John Smith's daughter, and you appear to be very, very pregnant, but I don't recall you getting married. The problem being, if you are an unwed woman who is pregnant in the 18th century, you can fall on the poor rates because the town, if your family won't cover it, officially has to pay for all of the medical expenses of your pregnancy called the laying in, and then all the medical and upkeep expenses for your child, your bastard, after it's born, which none of the town fathers want to do. This is a big deal throughout colonial America. It's been studied very deeply in New England, but not so much here in New York. And the patterns seem to be similar. So even though we don't have the exact data, we can give you an idea of what happens. So the overseers of the poor go along. And William Briggs his recognizance for bastardy is the start of this process. So, overseers of the poor are going along, and they see that Susanna Harrington, is out in Beekman, is pregnant, and she's not married, and the family is not going to cover this, so they say, Susanna, who's the father? And this can go one of approximately three ways. The easiest way for everyone is that Susanna says, William Briggs is the father, and it turns out that William Briggs is the father, and everything's settled. That doesn't always happen, though. Sometimes the women don't want to give up who the father is for any variety of reasons. So the justices will sit her down, and they'll be like, questioning her, asking her, no, 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 no. So fine, all right. We'll wait until she's in labor, and then we will ask the midwife to oh. refuse to grant any sort of assistance until she gives up the name of the father. Now, there's not a Hippocratic oath really used in the 18th century, but there are a lot of midwives who just do not subscribe to this idea. So they'll be like, are you kidding? No, this woman is in labor, I'm going to help. In which case, and this is like, 
I can't even imagine. The town fathers will crowd into the birthing room and ask her repeatedly, <laughs> well, why you to give up the name of the father? And if that doesn't work, then they'll essentially pick a name out of a hat. <laughs> because sometimes, sometimes, and we see this in other cases in other parts of Dutchess County, the paperwork specifically says the putative father, which makes no claims to biology or reality. It just says that legally we find X to be the father of this child. Because sometimes the father of the child is the master of the house, if the woman's a servant. Or sometimes someone who is socially unacceptable to be the father of a bastard. So they're like, that name's not right, try again. <laughs> we don't know if that happened in this case, but what this does is it provides us with the first step in the series of documents that would form a, a bastard suit. Which is, Susanna Harrington of Beekman's Precinct has gone to the justices of the peace. She said, yes, I am pregnant with a bastard, and the bastard's father is William Briggs. And they go through this formulaic language. That the, the recognizance is essentially a bond that you're going to show up in court. So Susanna says, William Briggs is the father. The constables are sent out to grab William Briggs, pull him before the justices of the peace. And the justices of the peace say, well, you need to show up at our next justices session, the local courts that we still have today, and answer to this charge, and we want to make sure you show up. So you're going to promise that if you don't show up, your sureties, your family or other friends, are going to come up with a large amount of money to make sure that you do. In this case, they want him to come up with, if he doesn't show up, One hundred pounds. So again, think about that. William Briggs is an agricultural laborer. He's supposed to come up with a hundred pounds if he doesn't show up to court. He makes four a year. <laughs> Flight risk. So, after saying how much money you owe, Recognizance says this is the condition where if you do this, you won't have to pay this money. And the condition tells us what's going on. So the condition of this Recognizance is such. That whereas the above bound in William Briggs is charged by Susanna Harrington of Beekman's Precinct in Dutchess County, single woman, that he had carnal knowledge of her body several times, and the said Susanna Harrington is now with child by him, the said William Briggs, when born, will be a bastard. If, therefore, the said William Briggs shall personally appear before His Majesty's Justices of the Peace, yada, 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 he will not have to pay the hundred pounds. If he doesn't show up, they're going to come seize everything his family owns and auction it off. So that essentially means that now the family is going to make sure he shows up to court. We don't have the rest of Briggs's case. But we do have the rest of John Brackett's case. Uh, so John Brackett, this is called an order in bastardy. This is the end of the process. The recognizance begins it because it says, all right, this now unwed mother has said, you're the father of the child, and you've been brought now in front of the justices of the peace, they've made a decision, hence comes the order in bastardy. So in this case, Mary Fuller, single woman, mother of a male pastored child, says that one John Brackett did beget on the body of the said Mary Fuller, the said male bastard child, which said child is becoming chargeable to the said precinct. The poor rates are becoming involved and the overseers of the poor have complained. So, as a result of this complaint, the local justices of the peace bring John Fuller, or John Brackett, they investigate, and they decide that he is the father of Mary Fuller. So, what are they going to do about it? So, to save harmless and keep identified the and indemnified the said precinct, and for the maintaining and keeping the said male bastard child, John Brackett is going to pay the following. First of all, he's going to pay the overseers of the poor 40 shillings just to cover the first four weeks of the, from the birth of the child. So this is paying off the midwife and then paying for the food and other support of the young mother and the child. And then after the first four weeks, that's two pounds, 40 shillings, right off the top. John Brackett will pay weekly the sum of two shillings and six pence lawful money of the province of New York for as long as this child is chargeable to 
the, the town of Beekman, essentially. And that he will appear at the next general sessions of the court in Poughkeepsie in order to swear out a bond that he is going to actually pay this money. Because that's the thing. If you've got an order in Bastardy against you and you live in Eastern Duchess, you might be tempted to go to Connecticut. Because <laughs> the New York authorities cannot pursue you there. But uh, the town fathers are aware of this. So once you get the, the putative father to Poughkeepsie, you have a bond sworn out by him that says if he runs off, then the sureties, the same guys when William Briggs were cognizant, were going to pay a hundred pounds, that no, this guy John Brackett's sureties are going to pay however much money the town fathers think will cover all of the charges until the child is old enough, for example, to be apprenticed at a trade and thus take care of himself. So for a male child that's probably approximately 12 years of age, for a female child they can be let out as a maid a little earlier, 10 to 11, but that's a long time to be on the parish poor rates and it's a long time for the father to pay the money. So ideally what happens is, and often this is the case, that the father and the mother are unwed because they essentially can't afford to be wed. So they will end up tying a knot, you'll have a happy family, all will be forgiven because everyone gets what they want, except perhaps for the putative father. But otherwise he's going to pay, which is how we get from sex back to money. At the end of our presentation tonight, if you have any questions, there's all of my contact info. And thank you very much. Questions I can answer? Quite possibly so. The great the question was, is that William Briggs of the Bastard E recognizance from Briggs Hardware? Well <laughs> so I was hoping there'd be a hotelling in the audience tonight to be like, oh yeah, we've got that story in the family. The names Families come to Duchess and they tend to stay, whether they arrived 300 years ago or five years ago. So this has a, that's why I've tailored these presentations to the localities in which I'm giving them. I saw a hand here and then there, so first. Before, before World War II, uh, I lived in a little three-acre farm on South Road. Mm -hmm. And uh, lightning struck the barn, burned the barn down, killed all our chickens, and. And so, anyway, my father bought a chicken house mm -hmm. someplace else, and the person that transported it on a big truck and trailer was John Hotel. <laughs> I'm sure not the same one from the 1760s. Exactly. It could be a, an immortal. Yes, sir. Then oh, I'm sorry. You, you mentioned that the, uh, the uh, Chicago Indians disappeared. Uh, uh, can you comment on the uh, history that has been written, although I don't know it, its veracity, that they were massacred? I have seen no definitive evidence that the Chicago Indians were massacred, at least here in Dutchess County. My understanding is that the Chicago went west <coughs> and joined with other portions of the Delaware Nation. And that nation suffered brutally in the 1790s. Yeah, that's right. That's the, sto I mean, I, the, the, the history books have the story. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the you know what the first evidence is that they were massacred here in uh, in Chicago, and uh, the survivors went down uh, just west of Philadelphia and joined uh, Delaware Indians there under the same religious uh, group, and that they in turn were massacred, so there was none left. I cannot say with any certainty about a massacre in Dutchess County because I haven't seen any firm documentation supporting it, but I can confirm what happens in the 1790s. Those Delawares go out west and they're hit during the Indian Wars of that period and it's entirely wiped out. Yes, yes Frank. Yes. In your, in your digging, did you come in any contact uh, remotely even with Aaron Burton? I have not run across any references to founding fathers in ancient documents. Well, Aaron Burr, it's my understanding that there is an association in falling, and uh, I know it was in agriculture, but uh, I'm not sure about any details. Unfortunately, I haven't run across anything that we've discussed. Yes. 
Yeah, Dick Berger. Dick lives right in Washington, right? Yes, when did, uh, when well, did we, I guess it's common exactly. law, if you cohabitate for seven years, the state considers you married? Where did that come into existence? Honestly, I think that that was something that existed in Britain during the 17th and 18th centuries for the poorest of the poor people. It was essentially a means by which the court could deal with the fact that even though these four folks are poor, they have some movable property that has to be split up after they die, and in the absence of any sort of formal marriage, because in Britain at the time, you didn't get married unless you were formally married, unless you have a certain economic setting. The common law marriage idea allowed them to say, okay, we've got two witnesses that said John Smith and Mary Moore lived together for seven years. Well, we'll consider them to be married and you know, his shoes and his clothes can go to her instead of any other claimants. But as far as that sort of thing here in America, I've never seen it actually brought up in a case in the colonial period, at least not here in the Northeast. One more question. Yes, ma'am. Oh, in the 50s, we would listen to Henry Noble McCracken on the radio. He had a 10-minute program at 8.10 in the morning, and he would refer to be going in the basement of the courthouse mm -hmm. looking at documents, and that was when he was writing his books. Mm -hmm. That's exactly, these are the documents that he saw, and we hope that he would be pleased to now see them a little bit easier yes. to accessible. <laughs> All right, thank you all very much. Uh, just real quickly, you, you, this, this, to me it's fascinating. Uh, I know there's a lot of things out there, but um, when I first became county clerk, we got a call from somebody from the Abraham Lincoln Papers Project uh, in Springfield, Illinois, and their, uh, their goal is to get every piece of paper that Lincoln signed or touched digitized. They called and said, we think you have a Lincoln paper. And I thought, ooh, this is pretty neat. I said, I'll come out and be here in, in a couple weeks, whatever. Can I, can I? We gave him the boxes. He went through them. Turns out there was a case in Poughkeepsie. The witness was in Springfield, Illinois. The judge um, uh, deputized or told Abraham Lincoln to take a deposition in the case from this one witness and submit it to the court. And that was in April of 1860. Lincoln got a little busy. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently it was never taken or we haven't found it yet. But uh, we keep looking. <laughs> you do, and, uh, and it's wonderful. Can you just talk about, for a second, the wide range of interest because of the internet in these documents? Yes, so word has spread that this project is going on. We are one of New York State Archives' favorite projects. That's why they keep funding us. But we've gotten all sorts of inquiries from all over, as far away as England. There is a team at the University of Sheffield that is a professor and his graduate students who are studying colonial law. And they wrote to us, and the professor was actually in New York City conducting research, and he said, can you tell me about this collection, because I want to know if I should make a trip up to Poughkeepsie to see it or not. And I said, well, you know, this is the nature of the collection. There's a lot of stuff here to see. How much time do you have? And oh, by the way, we're going to have this stuff online soon. And he said, well, I don't actually have any time to come up, but that's great. So we let him know when we put this online, and now we have that team working with it. We've had a bunch of inquiries from everyone, from genealogists to other university professors here in the United States. In fact, I got an inquiry this past week from someone who had a teeny tiny photo of the McCracken Index that had the name of her ancestor and the document number and said, can you please get this to me? And it turned out that that document, for whatever reason, had not been microfilmed by the Church of Latter-day Saints, but had been imaged by us. So I was able to send her a high-fidelity scan of a document that she otherwise wouldn't have gotten access to. But we launched this portal in January of 2016. By the end of 2016, it had received 30,000 hits. So it continues to spread to be a worldwide source and to direct ever more attention here to Duchess County. Now you can clap. Well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you Will. One of the other things Will has is a website which I put in the newsletter 
that anybody can look up and get that. If you let him know your email address, you will get to know what is going on as far as different uh, things in history for the whole country. Different events. Yeah, Give me your events. email and you will be on my distribution list sure. and you'll hear about all kinds of crazy stuff. Sure. Including more into the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.